Bibles, if you will, uh, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the 24th chapter, Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 24, and I'm going to read one verse of Scripture in your hearing uh, this morning, and then I'm going to bring to you a message that is titled, What It Takes to Be a Veteran of the Faith what it takes to be a veteran of the faith. Notice, if you will, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse number 6. And in that particular verse of Scripture, Jesus said this, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know, whenever I begin to think about what Jesus is saying there, there are so many people who try their best to give you a date on when Jesus is going to return. We look at signs of the time. And if you look at the signs of the time, Matthew's Gospel chapter 24 is fulfilling right in our faces today. And if you look at signs of the times, you would say it could be today. And it very well could be. Before we finish the message, Jesus could come. But of that day and hour, I know not. I know when he says that his father is the only one that knows that he is. Uh, of that day and hour knoweth no man but my Father, which is in heaven. And uh, one day soon, I believe that he'll come. I've been preaching that for over 35 years. And my pastor preached it before me. And his pastor preached it before him. And the cycle could go on and on and on uh, of those who's preached that from the pulpit. But yet Christ has not returned yet. But I still believe he's coming. Why do I believe he's coming? Because he said that he was. He said that he was coming. Whenever I begin to think about today's date being a very special day uh, in history, I want you to know that uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president from 1953 to 1961, and he received a letter from a little boy, a little boy eight years old, a little boy by the name of Keith uh, Aiken, now, or Kevin Aiken, I believe. This is what the young man said. The young man said, after listening to the news about the Cold War, he said, I am worried about all of the people in the world. Yet, hey, remember, eight years old. Eight years old. He said, uh, in thinking it over, Mr. President, he said, I have a plan. The plan of an eight-year-old. Listen, get all of the leaders together and all of them that want war, put them in a ring and just let them fight it out. Now, I'm sure that those of you that's veterans of foreign wars, you could probably say the same thing about war. You really could. Just let those that want to do the fighting get in a ring somewhere and just fight it out so that it don't involve all of these other people. War is a terrible thing, but, but yet it seems that war is something that is constantly going on in our world. We talk about peace and we talk about peace treaties and we want to see peace treaties. But friend, as long as man has lived since the fall of Adam and Eve, there's been war. And listen, there'll continue to be war. Because man's heart is evil. And uh, people desire power. If you talk to anybody from other places, uh, they'll tell you that uh, they had people to come into their countries and, and take over because they sought to be powerful individuals. I think the 
war right now that's going on in our own nation and in our state is because people want to think that they have power. But I want you to know this morning that there is one ultimate power, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And one day soon, I don't know when, but one day soon, he's going to come and he's going to set up a theocracy in this world that he created, and he's going to be Lord of Lords, and king of kings in that day. He's already Lord of Lord and king of kings in our hearts if we've trusted him as our savior. But I like what Jesus said. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now notice what he said. He says, see to it that you're not really alarmed about these things. What is he saying to us there? Quit worrying about it because it's, going on in your world and you don't have any control over it. Let me tell you something. I sit up half the night the other night during the election trying to see who was going to take control of this and who was going to take control of that. And, and I sit up half the night listening to that and, and, I, and I'm listening to all of that and all of a sudden God spoke to my heart and said, don't you know I'm still in control? Amen. So why don't you just go ahead and rest? Turn the TV off and go ahead and rest. Said, I'm still in control. Listen, most Bible commentators believe that, that Jesus was talking about the coming of the destruction of Jerusalem when he quoted uh, this particular, or when he said this particular scripture in um, Matthew 24, 6. And that took place at about 70 A.D. That's already happened. But it could be that that, that war was assigned to of the second coming of Christ. And I, that's what I believe. That it is a sign of the second coming of Christ. Uh, many theologians believe that. World War II, listen, World War II qualifies uh, as probably perhaps the greatest of, of all the wars and the most hellish of all the wars in all of history. And you see, in all about 61 countries uh, with 1.7 billion people, three-fourths of, of the world's population took part in World War II. Now, in terms of money, there was more than $1 trillion spent at the expense of, of war. Just think about how God could have used that money if man had just decided to love one another, like Jesus said that we need to do. The human cost of life included some 5 to 6 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust, plus 55 million dead, 25 million of those mil uh, military personnel, along with 30 million civilians. And these are just guesstimations. War, indeed, is a hellish thing. Some aspects of war are never right, regardless of the war, but we must support those who are willing to go and give in behalf of their country. Where would we be as American citizens today if people like those of you who served us faithfully were, were not willing to give your life, willing to give your lives to fight for our freedom, to fight for the freedom of an individual who won't even stand in honor of a flag that he hadn't done anything for, but run up and down a football field. But those of you who served your country, you fought for him to have that freedom. And I thank you for that this morning. That you were willing to, to give your life so that somebody else could have freedom. I don't know who wrote this, but it's some of the best words that I've ever read in my life. And I want to share it with you. It's the veteran, not the preacher, who gives to us the right of freedom of religion in the United States of America. It's the veteran. Not the reporter who has given us the right to have freedom of press in the United States of America. It's the veteran, not the poet, who's given us the right to have freedom of speech in this country. It's the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to assemble. It's the veteran, not the lawyer, who's given us the right for a fair trial. It's the veteran, not the politician, 
who's given us the right to vote. It's the veteran who salutes the flag and who serves under the flag. God bless the veteran who's willing to serve and give his life for his country. But yet and still, today while I honor you who served in our armed services, to you veterans we owe a a great debt of gratitude and and because you were willing to serve, uh, we serve God freely today. But I want us to think about what it takes to be a veteran of the faith. Something that we all need to do. Something that we all need to be if we're a child of God. We need to be a veteran of our faith as we serve Almighty God. There are three things that we need to do. Number one, we need to obey the commander. You see, the biggest problem that I see in our country today is lack of obedience to the commander-in-chief. And whenever I say that, I'm talking about the President of the United States, but the biggest problem in the Christian walk today is there's nobody really obeying the commander-in-chief. Who is our commander-in-chief? Jesus Christ is our commander-in-chief. He is the one who tells us how we need to walk this walk and what we need to do. You see, our president has authority. And while we may not always agree with our president, uh, what he says or what he, what he does, he's still our commander-in-chief, whether we like it or not. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4, the Bible says, Endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, if I were to stop what I'm doing just now and were to go around to every veteran that's ever served, in the United States military, no matter what branch you served in, every one of you could tell me some hardship that you went through. Every one of you could. And the Bible says that we need to endure that hardship like a good soldier. I wish that I could tell you that when you got to be a child of God that you'd never have any more hardship. But I got news for you. You see, now hardship's going to come more than ever. More than ever. ever. That's exactly right. Because you've got a real enemy. We're going to talk about him in just a little bit. But I want you to know that, 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 that you need to surrender to the hardship and endure that hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved with civilian affairs. Listen, one of the things that we were taught whenever I went through my training is that the outside world was a different world. Well, we're, am I not right, brother? It's a different world. We didn't worry so much about what, what, what our civilian counterparts were doing because we were busy and we had been trained to, to be a soldier and to endure hardship and to even surrender our lives if we had to for the cause, for the better cause, so that the civilian world outside could have their freedom. Our ultimate commander-in-chief is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible says that God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over, head over everything for the church. He's the head of the church. You deacons, I know you thought you were, but you're not. I know some of you thought the preacher might be, but he's certainly not. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and if he's not, then you don't have a church. You just got a, uh, a meeting place where you gather to have a good time. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus is our commander-in-chief. Luke 6, 46, the Bible says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say do? What else is there to say, friend? If we call him Lord, Lord, then he's our commander-in-chief, and we need to do the things that he says for us to do. We must obey the commander. Uh, Whenever I went uh, into service, I thought it was going to be a cakewalk. I really did. And I learned real quick like that I had a couple of drill sergeants that I didn't have much use for. And (laughs) I'll be very honest with you. Sometimes you get your mouth in gear before your brain thinks about what you're going to say. And I had one drill sergeant. Why do you always remember the name of the drill sergeant that you didn't like? You ever thought about that, brother? I don't remember the good drill sergeant. I had two. I don't remember the good drill sergeant's name. 
But I sure remember the bad one. His name was Drill Sergeant Robinson. And all he was trying to do was make me a better soldier. You know what I learned about basic training in the military? They break you so they can make you. But you know what? I was stubborn. I didn't want to be broken. I had my own will and I had my own agenda when I went in. I wasn't going to obey nobody. I was going to do my thing. And I shot my mouth off at the wrong time. And when I did that, that drill sergeant got on my back and rode me like a mule. <laughs> and I never saw any peace of mind the whole time that I went through training. I looked at him one day and I said, Drill Sergeant Robinson, I said, let me tell you how much use I got for you. I said, if I ever see you with your back turned to me and I can find me a two by four, I'm going to knock the back of your head off. <laughs> That's what I said to him. Biggest mistake I ever made in my life. He took me down into the latrine. Those of you who don't know what that is, that is the military bathroom. Yes. He pulled off his sergeant's hat and laid it on the counter. And he looked at me and he said, Young man, I am no longer your drill sergeant. I'm a man. You're a man. I understand you want to get me, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. I thank God that he gave me enough common sense not to swing at that man. I learned the art of humility that day, and I had a change of attitude. And I hate to say this to you as a church of the living God, but some of us need to have a change of attitude about our commander-in-chief. You see, we treat God like he's the great pie in the sky. That he's the genie that comes out of the bottle and all we got to do is make our wishes and he'll take care of everything. But friend, I want to tell you something. He's got a plan for our lives. He's laid out his agenda and he's given us his commandments and they're in this book that I hold in my hand called the Holy Bible. And friend, he tells us how we need to live, how we need to walk, how we need to talk. He tells us what to do when troubles, trials, and tribulations and adversity may come into our lives. He tells us how we need to live our lives. But the problem is we're too busy doing our own thing instead of obeying the commander in chief. Number two, friends, as a child of God, when you get saved by the grace of God, you better bet that you're going to engage an enemy. Did you hear me? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities and authorities and powers of the dark world and all of these spiritual forces of evil that comes against the heavenly realms. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, basically, be self-controlled and be alert, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking those in whom he may devour. You better bet that if you're a child of God, you're going to be engaged by an enemy. Amen. And if you're never engaged by him, you might want to give yourself a self-examination to see where you are with God. An old deacon who used to pray every Wednesday night in his church service, he concluded his prayer the same way every Wednesday night. He said, and Lord, God, please clean out all the cobwebs from my life. Well, it got to be too much for a fellow church member one Wednesday night. The old fellow prayed and he said, Lord, please clean out all the cobwebs in my life. And the old fellow jumped up and said, God, don't you do it. Don't you do it, God. Kill the spider, Lord. Kill the spider. That's what we need to do. Get rid of the spider. Get rid of the old devil. Sometimes we're focused on the cobwebs of life instead of the real enemy. The devil is the real enemy. Amen. Quit focusing on the cobwebs. And then thirdly and finally, when you begin to engage in the battle, don't ever give up. You fight to the end. Fight to the end. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus said, Men will hate you because of me, but he who stands to the end, the same shall be saved. In Matthew 24, verse 12 through 14, it says, In the last days there will be an increased 
of wickedness. The love of many will grow cold, wax cold, but he who stands firm, he who stands to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world and a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The Christian life is not a matter of coming to church on Sunday, as important as that may be, and then forgetting about all the faith that we have the rest of the week. You see, we're on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, sometimes things happen in our life to shake us up, to just let us know about our calling and what God has for us to do. I never complain about things that God brings into my life too much to you all. But that little lady sitting right back there, she hears a lot of things that you won't ever know anything about. And she prays for me. Yesterday I went to the uh, Lapa Hall Station celebration. Went with the sheriff and he and I had a good time. We throwed out candy to a pile of youngsters. Had a good time. After we got through with the parade and throwing out all of the candy, the sheriff said, he calls me Chap. He said, Chap, he said, why don't we just walk around a little bit, mix and mingle with the people. He's a pretty good politician, you know. <laughs> so we started mixing and mingling with the people. And Hayward Fowler, anybody know who I'm talking about? Hayward runs a little local television station in Tiffin. Hayward Fowler, came up and he put his big camera in my face and he said, D-Ray, D-Ray. He said, D-Ray, he said, I've never met a man of God that can preach a funeral like you do. And just earlier in the week, I said, my God, why do I have to preach so many funerals? Didn't I do it? I've been preaching funerals for 10 weeks. And I said, why do I have to preach so many funerals? And then God sent that man yesterday with his big camera right in my face. And he said, D-Ray, he said, I've never met a man that can preach a funeral like you do. He said, I've never met a man that loves people like you do. He said, it don't matter what they are, how they live, where they are in life, you love people. Well, you see what it's done to me now. You ought to saw what it does to me then. And I said, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for complaining about a gift that you've given me. Wage the war. Wage the war. Fight the battle. Don't ever give up. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you're called to wage this war, not to sit around and gripe about what we don't like in life or what we don't like about the church. Wage the war. Old Churchill, before he died, one of his most memorable speeches, listen to what he said. He said, we're going to fight on the beaches. We're going to fight on the grounds. We're going to fight in the fields. We're going to fight in the street. We're going to fight in the hills. And we won't ever surrender. Don't ever surrender to the devil. Don't ever do it. In 1 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I fought a good fight. Have we fought a good fight? Have we fought a good fight? We try to. We try to fight a good fight. But have we fought a good fight? Well, listen to what John Stuart Mill said. He died in 1873. He said, war is ugly. The ugliest of all things, the decayed, the degraded state a moral and patriotic feeling is much worse. The person who has nothing for which he's willing to fight for is a miserable creature. There are some things worth fighting for. Our freedom as American citizens and our freedom in Christ is worth fighting for. God bless the USA. God bless the United States veteran. And God bless you, the Christians of faith, who will not turn back. Let me close with this. Always remember, your general, Jesus, is in the forefront of the battle. And if I remember right, the Bible says, you as a willing soldier, you may be important, but the battle is the Lord's. Stand with me. Thank you so much, Lord.
for your love and your mercy and your grace. And now, God, we come to a time of commitment and decision. Help us search our hearts to see if we've been a true soldier of the faith or if there's things lacking in our lives. And, Father, if we see things that we don't like, help us do business with you at an altar of prayer. Father, if there be those that lost that needs to become a soldier in the army of the Lord, will you save? Move in this service now. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.